I thought about starting up a blog section on my website where I could write short little essays on things I think about, but I didn't actually want to implement that. Then I realized that I'm a professional YouTuber and have a second channel, and that I had entertained the idea of doing loosely edited ramble videos in the past on my second channel already. That's how we ended up here. Anyways, I wanted to react to a take I saw recently from Super Rad about reaction streams. I have this weird Mr. Incredible, Incredible Boy relationship with him where I'm partially inspiration for his videos, but at some point a while ago he started to resent me. I don't remember ever interacting with him, and I don't know the inciting incident. Anyways, I bring that up because he has me blocked, and this topic's too complicated for a Twitter post anyways. I have thoughts about this, and have had them for some time. This is not going to be me making fun of his take, which I have done before, more so just using it as a prompt to discuss something I've been thinking about since 2021. I'm not a lawyer, and this is not entirely me giving a case about how the law works. This is me talking about my sense of ethics and where I view the line when it comes to transformative content on the internet. I am someone who makes videos and also does reaction streams of videos. Generally, my reaction streams are part of my process for making the videos. I usually do documentaries, articles, interviews, as well as review and analysis style videos. I haven't done any recently, but that's for a different reason. This gives me the perspective that I generally don't want to steal views from people, which is why I have a general rule of not reacting to someone's video too soon after it releases. Because I don't want someone to do a reaction stream to my video right after it comes out. However, I view my videos as being fair game for a reaction stream to a point. You do not need my permission. My one qualification, like Super Rad, is that it has to be transformative. You do not need my permission, nor will I generally ask for permission to do a stream on someone's video. I've asked this before on a stream, but why is it okay to make your entire business about giving your reaction to video games, but when I do it about videos, suddenly it is bad? Here are my thoughts. A review, analysis, and even a comprehensive analysis is not stealing views. In the same vein, I do not view reaction streams as stealing views unless you fail to transform the original video. An example would be the Hassan stream where he watched a JXC video while saying almost nothing, including leaving the room at one point, and then cutting it off as soon as the viewers would have gotten information about the upcoming projects Jay was working on. This was blatant content theft for the purpose of filling time on a live stream. The reason it is bad is that people who would be potential viewers, who would contribute financially and algorithmically to the original video creator, now won't because they've already had the experience of watching the video because Hassan failed to meaningfully transform it. Here is where I am different. When I do a long stream reacting to someone's video, that is going to be a different experience than watching that video. I pause a lot, take notes, talk over it, rewind, talk to chat. On many streams, there's a giant breasted anime girl on the screen. If you're a fan of Never Knows Best, I doubt you could say my live streams reacting to his videos are substitute replacements for the original videos. It is a different experience. In the same vein, you would not say my 20-hour Skyrim video, as comprehensive as it is, is a substitute replacement for playing Skyrim. If you liked the video I was reacting to, chances are you will either have watched it or will watch the video for yourself, or watch other videos by the same creator after. It could be an opportunity to be introduced to someone new, or reintroduced to someone you thought you did not like the style of. And if you don't like what I'm reacting to, then I'm not stealing the view because that person would not have watched the video. In fact, it's fair to say a decent chunk of the audience watching my live streams are not going to be viewers of whomever or whatever I happen to be reacting to that day. The only reason I have the rule against watching new videos is that I want people's audience to have a chance to watch the video first, so that my stream doesn't impact their algorithmic ranking and ability to find new fans. Once a video has settled, I view it as fair game. Because I don't know before I do the reaction stream if I'll like the video, if I did, I could see it as a good thing to do a positive reaction stream for a new video, because then people could potentially support the video when it needs it most. But the reason I don't know how I will view the video is because the whole point of the stream is to watch it for the first time. 
Ironically, I was actually expecting Never Knows Best to have a good Skyrim video because he had a good Oblivion video, and I was positive towards it when I was doing the Oblivion stream series. You can't know without pre-watching the video how you will react, and of course, that means the stream is no longer a reaction. Anyways, that is just my personal rule, based on how I would want my videos to be treated. But let's discuss stealing views. How does that meaningfully impact a video? Generally speaking, depending on the stream series, I would range an average viewership. With Oblivion, it was 200 live viewers. With Skyrim, it was 4 to 500. With Starfield, it was around 700. Then you have the VODs. Personally, I prefer watching VODs over streams anyways, and I'm sure many people do as well. These would range from a few thousand to the early tens of thousands. Is it fair to say that I am subtracting 17,000 VOD views and 500 live views from Never Knows Best? Probably not. Again, people watching the streams are going to be a mix of people who have already seen the video, people who may start watching his other videos, and people who may have decided to not watch them. And there's no telling how many are repeat viewing the VOD. People have told me that they will repeat view my VODs. Obviously, if I only do negative streams of people's videos, they probably won't become viewers of them. I mean, you never know. Maybe people get tired of me and decide to start watching the people who I hate. Now, obviously, I'm not saying this is how Super Rad looks at it, but I have heard this take before. If I found the correct channel that reacted to his video, then I don't think the average 300 views his VODs get is going to impact his pay. Like, at all. That said, patronage throws this all out of whack. Sure, denying somebody potentially thousands of views can be a big deal, but a few people potentially becoming fans and eventually donating money could completely counteract the revenue loss from a reaction stream, depending on your channel's CPM. More to the point, if I make a negative stream the day Starfield comes out, that potentially causes people to not buy the game, but that is my right. I am allowed to share my opinion, as long as it is in good faith, that people can then use to inform their purchasing decision when it comes to video games. Why wouldn't that apply to YouTube videos as well? Sure, I don't watch new videos, but maybe me watching someone's Skyrim video knocks it off your video backlog. Point is, I don't think we know the straightforward effect that a transformative, emphasis on that, video reaction stream has upon a video. If it isn't transformative, then it is stealing those views. I suppose that raises the question of if the streams are actually transformative. It's complicated, but I think so. Not in a I don't know if it's legal way, I mean it is my personal opinion that the law should be that what I am doing should be considered as transformative. It can be complicated though. Technically, there's no rule that states what percentage of content used constitutes fair use, which is news to me. A long time ago when I was learning about fair use, it was considered common that you cannot exceed more than 10% of the original work. However, that would complicate certain things like, for example, poetry analysis. Here is Emily Dickinson's poem, Success is Counted Sweetest. This poem has 53 words, 293 characters, so to be within fair use under this hypothetical 10% rule, I could only show you the first five words, which is coincidentally 29 characters long. Obviously, an analysis of this poem that is limited to just five words would be pointless, difficult, and potentially impossible. This is a hypothetical, so Emily Dickinson's poems being in the public domain is not relevant to this argument. In most practical cases, what's considered fair use is up to the creator, and if there is a conflict, then in the court of public opinion and finally civil court i.e. you can decide when making videos or streams whether or not you think the 10% rule is fair. It is likely a very good rule to follow if you want to avoid ever having your work claimed as not being fair use. I obviously do not follow this rule in either my videos or my streams. I have reacted to far more than 10% of games like Skyrim and Starfield and have reacted to 100% of some videos. Where I personally draw the line is that my work is not a substitute replacement of the experience, like I said. Now, would legal precedent or a judge agree with my argument? I don't know. We are just speaking in the realms of being mutual content creators on where we draw the line. Let's talk about permission. Technically, getting permission is effectively a letter of intent preceding a license agreement. With a license, there would be no possible issue of fair use because I have permission from the copyright holder to do the stream. 
In practice, though, this would be like asking Microsoft for permission to review Starfield. It would be so obviously silly because then you would never get meaningful reviews because people would be too scared to do negative reviews knowing that their permission could go away the next time they go to do a review. If you want proof of this, go look at the day one Starfield reviews. Those are mostly people wanting to maintain positive relationships to keep getting advanced copies of games. Asking people to request permission to react to your videos is effectively declaring you intend to gatekeep who can criticize you, which is convenient when you have me blocked. I think it's silly, I won't ask for permission to review or analyze any game, and I will not ask for permission to react to a video. If you are friends with me, I may decide to incorporate you into the reaction. I also do not generally inform people in advance that a stream is going to happen. I did not from the start and had this decision affirmed when I reacted to someone's Skyrim video, and they spent the entire stream trying to debate every single point to a standstill, making the process take three times as long. I get if you want to defend yourself or your points, but the point of the stream is not to be a takedown or debate in the first place. Go to the comment section. It's just watching videos to collect consensus, data about how people played, and to refine the points I want to make in my own video. Oftentimes, it's more so I'm using the videos to get the chat to discuss my points with me to make what I want to say better. There is the strategy take that, even if I'm not doing the streams to intentionally plagiarize people, I will accidentally plagiarize someone because... I guess the idea will be rattling around in the back of my head. I find this to be an extremely pathetic way to look at things. It's just an excuse to not do any research. I totally get not wanting to do comprehensive research because you wish to release more than two videos a year. Fair enough. But don't diss the way I do things just because you don't like that you didn't get to control which of your videos I watched. To make the case that in 20 hours of takes, every single one needs to be something someone hasn't already said already, I mean, it just sounds crazy. Some people genuinely look at creativity that way, though. If they aren't the first person to say something, then they will not speak. If I say the companions are bad, that's a take someone has given. I'm not going to come up with a flowery way to say that just because I'm concerned that I'm not the first person on Earth to publish that opinion. I have had that opinion since the game came out. But it is funny that sticking my head in the sand and not knowing what other people are saying is considered a valid defense against that. It's okay to regurgitate the same milk toast takes as every other Skyrim video before me, because then at least I will be authentically uncreative. I know my Skyrim video is unique, and I know it's unique because I've seen almost all of them. If I copy someone else, it's usually their mannerisms and the way they present information for a little while. The reason I take notes is that I genuinely cannot remember the specifics of what people say in their videos, especially the several dozen hours of repetitive Skyrim videos I watched. Trust me, there were only like four videos that even had anything worth stealing. Yours wasn't one of them. I also know that Strategy folded as soon as my response video came out, because he realized that he probably should not praise the video, simply because it's critical of someone he doesn't like. Did you unironically hear the part where Never Knows Best weaponized a guy's dead sister and think, hell yeah, now that's a good takedown video? Or did you see that someone you didn't like was being criticized and defended it as part of tribalism? Super Rad also liked this video, by the way. Same question, is playing sad violin music while stating the fact that someone's sister passed away, even though it's completely irrelevant to any points being made, something that you will positively associate with? Or is it that you just don't like me? Also, I like the contradiction that Super Rad said he didn't plan to flag anyone, and then 10 hours later said he planned to request a takedown. Fun fact, I've actually been requested multiple times to propose various Super Rad videos for EFAP episodes. The drama alone could be fun, but I'm not sure it's my speed. It would have to be after they make a few changes to their program, though. That's a whole separate topic I thought about doing, but I have some ideas about how they can improve their show. My final thing is an idea I had a while ago. I've always wanted a program where you could record when you pause and play a video, and what speed you are playing it at. That way I could record the stream without recording the audio from the video we're watching. Then I could upload the VODs, but the only way you could watch along with the video is to watch the original with those coded instructions to pause and play automatically alongside the VOD. That way the majority of people who see the stream will have to contribute views and watch time to the original video. Then the only thing being stolen is the viewership from the original live stream. Now, I could potentially use Watch Together for this with a bunch of viewers. I wouldn't, if only because I would have to periodically explain how to see the actual video. Trust me, my experience rebroadcasting various things like Summer Games Fest has told me that viewers cannot handle turning on a stream and needing additional instructions to participate. But again, this fantasy software would just be a courtesy to make sure people are being compensated for their watch time. 
I obviously do not think it's so amazing or important of an idea to make it myself, but it would largely solve the problem and keep everyone happy.